Hi, I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com, and welcome to Fast Forward, where we have conversations about living in the future. This is a special South by Southwest edition of Fast Forward, and my guest is also very special. It is Kimberly Bryant, the CEO and founder of Black Girls Code. We're going to talk about how the organization has evolved since she founded it, and how it's working to close and to bring some diversity to the technology space. Kimberly, thanks so much for talking to me today. Thank you so much for the conversation. So you started this organization eight years ago in part so that your daughter, who is a middle school aged, could go to computer classes and not be the only girl in the class and, the not, and not the only person of color in the class. Mm -hmm. um, so that was eight years ago. Uh, is she still coding, or did she decide to do something else with her life? <laughs> she actually is still coding. She's a freshman majoring in computer science at University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and uh, really still interested in pursuing computer science and technology as a career path. So how did you get into technology yourself? Like, what, what inspired you? You know, what got you on this path? For me, I, my background is in electrical engineering with a minor in computer science. I sort of stumbled into this career path. I never really had an aspiration as a, a young child to be a computer gamer or anything like that. I wasn't into that. I certainly was the Barbie type of kid growing up. Mm -hmm. Um, but I found myself on this accelerated path in math and science through middle and high school, and it was actually my guidance counselor who were like, wow, well, you should look into engineering. There's a, a good career field. There's lots of you know, good pay in this, and this is what you might want to consider. And I did, and I had to really learn about what this career would entail once I got to college. Um, so very different than my daughter's path or many of the other girls that we work with. And, but I think that's telling, too, is that a lot of kids, you know, we want to help them find their careers and find their way, but a lot of them don't know. And, and a serendipitous discovery can be just as powerful as, like, I wanted to be a, a computer gamer since I was 12 years old. Absolutely. I think for me, uh, one of the difference in my childhood versus my daughter is that I was really um, on this gender path, um, even as a young I would say he's at six or seven, and I had an older brother, and he would get the things that were more sciency for Christmas, and given those opportunities to play video games and things, but not me. You know, I was certainly, um, I would say, led to things that were not, you know, the things that were more science and tech from my familial upbringing. Not when I got to school, then it became a bit more level. And so for my daughter, I was very intentional when I, she was growing up to make sure she had the Legos and the Lincoln Logs that were all over the house at one time or the other, just as much as I was, you know, introducing her to a Barbie doll. So I thought it for me, it was very important that I did not put any barriers on what she could do or be interested in as a young girl. And I think that's important. And it, it leads to girls finding their place in a lot more organic way than I did. So Black Girls Code, talk, talk to me about how it works. Mm -hmm. How does the organization close these gaps? Black Girls Code is a nonprofit organization, and we focus on introducing girls as young as six or seven. We stay with them until they're 17. Now we're starting to work with our alumni in a series of after-school programs and workshops. So that could be a Saturday workshop where they're coming in and learning about virtual reality. It could be a more intensive summer program where they're coming in for two to four weeks and doing everything from full stack development to and it could be doing artificial intelligence or blockchain. We try to really reach the girls in a place where um, it can supplement what they're now starting to see in the classroom. And so many schools are starting to teach computer science, but give them an opportunity to go a little bit deeper and also be surrounded by a community of girls that share the same interest and background and upbringing, which makes it a bit different from an experiential standpoint. How do you find the participants? How do you find the girls that are interested in this sort of thing? Um, now, eight years later, most of the time they find us. So we've had such a really um, ex extensive community of both parents and educators that 
will be the ones that introduce girls to Black Girls Co. because they've heard about us in the different cities that we participate in and the different things we do, like coming to South by Southwest. So we don't really have to do a lot of pulling into the organization now, which is a great position to be in. Um, but when we do, we try to partner with schools or other community-based organizations like Girls Inc. that serve girls and allow them to you know, find a space that their girls can come in and learn about STEM and technology. There's, I've interviewed um, some people from Girls Who Code, and they, we've partnered with them at PC Mag, mm -hmm. um, and they've been doing it for a while too. And what happens is over time, the the students that you're training come back to the organization and then become mentors. Absolutely, and it creates this virtuous circle that. Um, can be really effective. Is that, have you seen that too? Absolutely. So for this South by Southwest, we actually brought with us 14 alumni students from all over the U.S. that are attending colleges or they're about to graduate from high school. And it was really interesting. I want to, as we were leaving the airport coming over to South by to check in our hotels, I was sort of eavesdropping uh, and ear hustling on this conversation that was happening in the back seat with one of the college students to two of the upcoming seniors. And she was asking them, like, where did you apply to college? And, you know, how's that going? And just listening to this very organic conversation was uh, so fulfilling because they were not only, you know, mentoring each other, but they really had this sisterhood um, so, so easily with each other and, and the, they were just having this fantastic conversation in my mind. But we also do it on a more formal basis and we have girls that come in as junior camp counselors during the summer. We have girls that come in and do a gap year. My daughter did that and they actually work with Black Girls Co. We have girls that come back and actually become the instructors in the workshops that we do during the the weekends. Um, so we have very structured ways for them to give back, but we also love to see the organic pairings that have and, and see the older girls become mentors for the younger girls. So the, there have been a lot of reports um, about how the, the how the Silicon Valley in particular, but technology in general is, is just is less diverse than many other industries. Mm -hmm. um, and it mm -hmm. seems like there's something unique to the technology industry that's that's holding it back, that's, that's preventing this from moving faster. Do you have any theories for like, what is wrong with, with technology in particular that is slowing this down? I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with the tech. I mean, the tech has no inherent bias. Right. It has only the bias that we build into it. I would say that would be the same even for technology companies. So when I was graduating from college, or just starting college in the mid 80s, they're about 32, 35% of women and getting degrees in computer science and now it's like 12 to 14%. But what was happening in 85 to 89 was that was the birth of the PC. That's mm -hmm. when Apple was becoming a thing. There was when Intel and solid state technology was really starting to um, exponentially grow. And the industry started to change in terms of the dynamics of who was sitting in those chairs, who was building these products. And they did not include a lot of women. And a lot of women that were veterans in the field began to be pushed out. So I think over the next several decades, we saw that continue to happen. And we saw then women not even aspiring to go into those fields because this image of the male geek became a phenom. And that's mm -hmm. what girls did not want to be a part of. So I think now this cultural bias is embedded in these companies. And it's going to be up to us in this generation and the next to kind of change that narrative. We uh, have an archive, PC Magazine's been in business since 1982, and we've got an archive of magazines that goes all the way back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. And the content is wonky tech content, but if you go through the advertisements mm -hmm. of those mid-80s PC Magazines, you really do see a lot of the, the, the gender portrayals, which are just, I mean, would totally not fly today. Absolutely. But they were built into the PC industry at a very early day. Very much so. I think a couple of years ago, I saw a picture back from the launch of the Macintosh, and it felt like it maybe was Megan Smith who was doing it in a presentation. I always learned from her. And there were women in that founding group of founders that I'd never seen before. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> stop the press. It's like, there are women there? And they were certainly there, but all of the images that I had grown up with and seeing 
did not include them. So I didn't even recognize that women were very much a part of that innovation. I only knew like Waz and, and, and um, Steve, like mm -hmm. well, there are women there too, and they did important things. And I think that's what's really important now is that we make sure that this generation of, of innovators don't get ridden out of history. So, uh, you know, it seems like a fundamental point, but I think we should get to the, to the issue of like, why is it important that these tech companies be more diverse? Mm -hmm. um, what does it mean from a social justice perspective, but also what does it mean from an economic perspective, mm -hmm. given the economy that we're living in right now? Well, from a social justice and equity perspective, I think it's very important with the shifting demographics, not only in the U.S., but abroad, that are bringing um, a change, such a change in what we look at as, as far as distribution of uh, demographics in the world, where women will be the majority, we, if we're not already there, mm -hmm. and that the nation is really starting to change in terms of the composition of, of who is here and, and who is in the workforce. So I think it's important that as these products and solutions are being created, they meet the needs of everyone. And that won't happen if only one individual is creating all the solutions. It will be, um, it will be, we'll miss so many of the solutions and needs that, that we need to attend to. I think on the economic side, it's the same argument. Like if you're only building for one class of individual, what about the needs of black women? What about the needs of Latino women? What about the needs of gender diverse categories of individuals? Those voices are necessary right at the start of creation to ensure that Everyone has an opportunity to not even have a solution that meets their needs, but for companies to actually be uh, fiscally viable and be able to serve the population as it looks. It's actually, there's a great example of uh, that first generation of, of machine vision AIs. Mm -hmm. We're having a very difficult time recognizing people of color. Absolutely. And they go into the data and they're like, oh, it turns out that we just didn't have enough people of color in our data sets. Absolutely. So therefore, the AI wasn't being trained properly because it had a limited data set. Yes, one of my very um, successful and brilliant mentees is up at MIT now and doing a lot of work on this very thing around AI and bias. And I think her work is so vitally important to this work because if we look at AI being um, the trend of the future, it's going to be important that we have brilliant technologists like her pointing out where there is a gap so that we can structure this AI so it doesn't either kill us all off mm -hmm. or forget about half of us that are sitting in this space and they're supposed to be I'm recognizing. So you've got a goal of uh, having uh, one million black girls coding by 2040. Mm -hmm. How far along are you? Do you think you're going to hit that goal? I absolutely think we're going to hit that goal. Some of it is not about necessarily girls that we are directly touching, but also about these 10,000 students that we've reached to date and how they influence others. I think one of the things I say quite a bit is that if we teach one girl to code, she'll teach 10 more. And so it's there's an exponential growth and an exponential referral system that organically happens by the students that are engaged with BGC and what they go out in and who they influence when they leave our, our organization and community. So how can people watching and seeing this video, how can they help and how can they participate in the process? Well, one of the things that's very unique about Black Girls Code that I'm most proud about is that we're a very small team. There's only about 10 or 12 of us, but we are powered by a literal army of volunteers, over 2,000 each year, that help us deliver these workshops all over the U.S. and abroad. So if someone really wants to get involved, they can volunteer for one of our chapters as either a technical volunteer or a non-technical volunteer. They can get engaged with their companies and have them sponsor an event, sponsor a chapter, or sponsor a student. Or they can also, you know, traditionally, we, we are nonprofit, so we do take donations. So go onto our website, um, help us to do more and more of this work, and just um, help us to spread the word. I want to ask you some questions I ask everybody that comes on the show. Okay. Um, is there a technology trend that uh, concerns you and that keeps you awake at night? We already talked about the artificial intelligence, without a doubt. I don't think we have enough technologists of color that are um, in the weeds, so to speak, as this being built. And I think that's where we have the most possibility of getting it wrong. And that's the one thing I want to see our girls get more involved in. On the positive side, the technology that I'm most optimistic about is blockchain. We also teach, absolutely. 
I really just started to learn more about what the blockchain actually is, and I see it as such a potential for creating equity in technology. And I think it could be actually utilized as a tool to to really correct some inequities in the space. And what about what about the technology do you, do you have that faith in? Is it that it's distributed and that you Absolutely. can create an entirely new system that's not? It's distributed. I think one of the things about our industry right now is that we have just a handful of big players that control a whole lot mm -hmm. and is shrinking on a daily basis. But blockchain offers the possibility of shifting control, shifting ownership, and distributing it out in a way that could, if used correctly, could up in technology industry as we know it. I think that's very exciting. And, and I don't think, I think because a lot of us don't understand it, we don't know how powerful it could potentially be. Yeah, I'm interviewing Joe, Joe Lubin in a couple of I days. Yeah, we work with them. Yeah, and, <laughs> we um, work with I'm going to do some prep, but it, it, it's yeah. such a, blockchain's a complicated thing to wrap your head around. Absolutely. We've been writing about it for years, and it's still, it's hard to translate in, a, in an easy way. Yeah, I agree. The um, so uh, how can people, is there a technology you use every day that, that still inspires wonder? Huh, let me see. I don't think there's anything that I use every day that inspires wonder. I think a technology that I use every day that I sometimes wish I didn't was social media. I mean, the good and bad pieces of it. But it's an opportunity for me to tap into connecting with folks far outside of my local community in ways that I can see ideas be pushed forward. And I think it's a very powerful tool for that reason. Yeah. I think with social media, what we're discovering is that as long as we're using it mm -hmm. and it's not using us, Absolutely. then there can be a lot of benefits. Absolutely. It's when you sit back and you're allowed to be programmed by the algorithms and by the economic system that funds the platforms. Yeah. That's where problems start to happen. Uh, I agree, but sometimes I think we don't even understand how we are being programmed. So I think it's a it's a it's a give take piece of it there that 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 we need to figure out. Great, great. Kimberly, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you for having me again. That's Fast Forward for today. If you want to see back episodes of Fast Forward, you can find them on PCMag.com, on YouTube, on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, everywhere that fine podcasts are given away for free. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'll see you in the future.